Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Alan Lumsden. I'm the chair of Cardiovascular Charity here at Houston Methodist, and I'm glad you could join us here in what we call the DeBakey CV Live Studios. Uh, we run boot camp every year, and we can't, of course, have that at the moment, and so we refer to this as Backyard Boot Camp. And we've got an interesting title for you this afternoon. It's a little unorthodox, and it's about the infected aortic endograft diagnosis and therapy. So let me get a couple of thank yous done first of all. Thank you for Medtronic for sponsoring this. Uh, we really appreciate their support in uh, vascular surgery education. Now let me introduce my partners here in the studios. First of all, to my right is Dr. Ponraj Chinardere. Ponraj has an interesting background. He is a physician uh, who spends his life working on advanced therapies and imaging with Siemens. And so he's a research scientist. We've been very fortunate for having him embedded here in the Heart and Vascular Center. And remotely, we've got Dr. Muaz Almala. Uh, he heads up the PET program here at Methodist. Um, think of these as the diagnostic guys <laughs> you know, that, that are going to help us in, do, in dealing with the diagnosis part of this title. And to my left is my partner, Dr. Maham Rahimi. Uh, he is uh, one of the, our vascular surgery partners, and he's taken a great interest in infected drafts in general. So you got to love a partner who wants to take on the worst of the worst cases, because this is not an easy way to make a living. So we're going to kick it off by going to Dr. Rahimi, and he's going to give us a few slides just about some background. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, I'll make it brief. The EVAR infection rate is less than 1%. Uh, if you do an open operation, less than 5%. Uh, open operation management of the EVAR infection is the, is the treatment of choice. Uh, if you do non-operative, it's a high mortality, uh, 35%, 75%, depending if you have uh, gas or what type of uh, bacteria you have in the system. Uh, if you have aortoenteric fissure on top of that, the, the chance of infection and mortality is much higher and as high as 30 days mortality of 50% for aortoenteric fistula. And with the hemodynamic instability, the mortality keeps going up. The lowest 30 days uh, mortality and uh, highest one year survival is in situ uh, repair of the EVAR uh, infection. And uh, the serious number of the aortic stump uh, blowout is up to 10 to 20 percent uh, chance, and that is the reason the in situ repair is most often the repair of the choice. Uh, using prosthetic graft, using uh, refampant soaked Dacron, has the uh, higher rate of limb salvage uh, with infection recurrence of up to 10 to 20, 10 to 40 percent. Just an overview, uh, when the patient present, uh, this is, these are things I'm thinking about. Patient status, uh, resuscitation, antibiotics, imaging, and operative planning. The patient status, the important part of it is, is the patient stable or unstable? Are they in the hemorrhagic shock or uh, septic shock? And the resuscitation, ICU admission, line placement, and antibiotics is the important part of the management of these sick patients. And based on the imaging, most often CT angiographing, you can determine the anatomy and proximal uh, uh, fixation of the endograph because the management is different. Where you put the clamp for uh, proximal clamp is different if you have a suprarenal fixation versus infrarenal fixation. And how the extent of the stent graft goes. Some people manage the uh, type 1 endoleak by place, placing palm oz stand that could go as high as SMA, and that has a different approach in order to repair this. And lastly, from CT scan, do you need to do revascularization? Do you need to uh, revascular to the iliac or the femoral arteries? As far as the intra-op preparation, uh, the, the, the usual arterial line, uh, the large central line, and urethral stent because it's going to be an inflamed site when you open the belly. I usually use uh, Dacron graft refampant soaked, 600 milligram refampant in 250 minutes of saline, and usually soak it for 30 minutes. So while anesthesiologist putting the lines in, this is what I'm doing in the background, and soaking and getting the graft ready. And based on the CT, I've already determined, am I going to clamp in the thoracic area or am I clamp inside the abdomen? And if it's a thoracic area, patient need to be in the right lateral decubitus uh, on the moldable beam bag with axillary roll with a double lumen or tracheal tube. If I'm going transabdominal, retroperitoneal, again, the position is different. If you go in transabdominal, 
be prepared to do X by them because plan A might not work and you have to know are you going from the right side or left axial artery for the inflow. After removing the endograft, uh, these are the process that I go through. Um, <coughs> proximal and distal clamping, uh, removing the pus, removing the infected tissue as much as possible, then uh, putting an iodine soaked uh, lap pad on the wound bed. Usually I use 50% uh, saline, 50% iodine, and then finish the proximal anastomosis. I hold the graft up, I don't get the graft exposed to the bed yet, remove uh, more tissue as necessary, uh, and then use a pulse wash with a rifampin solution. And then I finish my distal anastomosis. Now the ischemic reperfusion, you have to be careful with that. You have to be careful with the hypotension, discuss with the anesthesiologist to get ready for hypotension. And sometimes there are allopurinol, mannitol, the steroid can be used. And I've used a few times intra-op dialysis in order to manage uh, the patient's uh, electrolyte abnormality after uh, uh, ischemic reperfusion. And you can use your fingers uh, slowly releasing the, uh, the limbs uh, so the anesthesiologist can, can catch up. Now, some of the advantage of transabdominal versus retroperitoneal, uh, it's usually uh, uh, surgeon's preference. This is an important slide. How do you get these graphs out? And uh, there are four different techniques described. One of them just pulling them out uh, if they don't have uh, super renal fixation, but still have to be careful. The other one, if the graph is not coming out, just uh, cutting the graft out and leaving the super renal metal in place is a way of managing this and just suturing uh, into the normal aorta at that point. The other technique is Rommel and Javet technique, which is shows uh, uh, in the far left, lower left. The other technique using a syringe technique, it's called barrel technique, and that's the one that I usually use and I like to use because it's, uh, it's very reliable. If I may uh, show the technique to you, I have a, I have a syringe over here and I have an endograft. And without applying pressure, you don't want to pull this because you're going to tear the aorta. It's going to be a long day to get a proximal control. I'm controlling this, but I'm rotating this forward. As I'm rotating this forward, this push forward and gets the uh, struts off the aorta. And you can easily remove this uh, without having the, the hooks on top of the aorta and, and ripping through. And that would, that would be a very uh, lethal thing that could happen. So, Maham, can I ask a question? Do you capture the hooks with this, or do you just do what you did here? Do you, you bring it up and you can feel them disengage from the wall? The second option. So I don't capture the hook with it. I just want to disengage that radial mm -hmm. force. And that's, that's mostly what and I'm that, working with. You can tell that by feel? By feel. Uh -huh. Purely feel. Mm -hmm. I can't see it. Yeah. I can't see it. Sometimes this technique doesn't work and I cannot force it because it will tear the aortic wall and again that, that, that could be lethal. And so I mean the other discussion is it, it's metal. You want to get the fabric out. Do you really care if you get the metal out? I don't. Yeah. So don't. maybe we always have a pair of um, metal cutters and the four wire cutters on the field so you can just cut these things off and, and leave them behind. But you want to get the fabric out, obviously. I, it's much better if you get it all out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and it could get more complicated, Dr. Lemson, if yeah. you have endo anchors in there. And, and mm -hmm. those uh, wire cutters become very helpful for those cases. Posteriorly, it's very challenging to get. So uh, it's, it's a challenging problem, mm -hmm. uh, certainly. The services that involve uh, vascular surgery, plastic surgery, general surgery, intensive care, radiologists. We are very lucky here uh, that we have a radiologist uh, such as uh, Ponraj and Dr. Amela to help us for those cases that we do CTA but we don't have a diagnosis of what, if it is infected or not and it has a low grade infection. That's where PET-CT comes to play. That tells you with higher sensitivity and specificity if the graph is infected and you make your clinical judgment based on that. Also you need to get the infectious disease involved, PEC line, IV antibiotics six to eight weeks and PO antibiotics for life. It's important to tell a patient you're going to see your primary care in five years and they're going to take you off that antibiotics and you need to tell them, my vascular surgeon said I need to be on that PO antibiotics for life. And then wound care and then social work. Going to briefly go over the SVS recommendation and we'll start our cases. 
Now, the SVS recommend if patients undergoing any uh, 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 oral mucosa surgery, such as going to their dentist, uh, they recommend to get antibody prophylaxis for if they have a history of EVAR or open surgical repair of their aorta when they use the uh, uh, graft. Now, when the patient shows up in the ER, a prompt evaluation is necessary because these patients present with a vague symptom, fever, chills, fatigue, night sweats, weight loss, uh, and they might not have a clear-cut diagnosis. That's where imaging is very crucial. I'll make this simple for you. If the patient has gross purulent appearing in the CT scan and imaging, that's where you're going to think about extra anatomical, but most often, in situ bypass is the right answer. And for my practice, I would stop using cryo because cryo, in, in, in my experience, it melts all throughout the, the, the graph, but the rifampin soak, antibiotic soak, Dacron, the only problem is at the anastomosis site. So I have stop using cryo. And that doesn't mean that's the right thing to do. It just I, I don't use that anymore. So uh, when, you, when you say cryo, you're talking about cryopreserved aortic graft. Yes, sir. And one of the challenges, most of the, well, endografts are a little bit differently, but a lot of the open grafts are aorta by FAMS. And one of the problems is when you get an aortoiliac segment, you get a long aortic body and two little short iliac legs. So you got to make sure that you order iliac conduits to go with that. Otherwise, <laughs> you can't reach uh, uh, far distal as you need to be going. Yes, sir. And sometimes they are very small. And, and what I had used in past, I used a thoracic aortic uh, cryo mm -hmm. and then suture that to the uh, grafts that I'm getting, the cryograph. If you think about extra anatomical, uh, extra anatomical bypass, it's crucial to uh, to have a good aorta for aortic stump. If you don't have a good aorta to sew, uh, you need to do some kind of renal bypass, hepatorenal, spinorenal, or aortorenal, in order to be able to get a healthy aorta for suturing the aortic uh, stump. The blowout is real, as high as 10%, and it could be, again, lethal. And then you need to cover that aortic stump with uh, either omentum flap, which we showed later on, rectus abdominis, if you have time, I'll show you that as well, or gerodas fascia, or prevertebral anterior spine fascia, or ligament. It's crucial to use that. Now, if the patient is unstable, uh, again, in situ uh, uh, reconstruction of the aorta is important. If the patient is not bleeding uh, and patient is on septic shock, it's, it's good to put a drain in. It's good to uh, do an egg slap and uh, uh, remove the pus, remove the infection, go back a day or two when the patient is stable, and then do the in situ uh, reconstruction. This patient gets very unstable in the operating room, so you have to be careful taking the unstable patients uh, to the operating room. And that's all I have uh, to share with you as far as the background for the aortic endograph goes. We're going to go through some cases. We're going to go through the importance of the CT scan and PET CT to talk about how they come to play in diagnosis and then with the video is management of them. All right. So you want to kick it off? Showcase? Absolutely. <clears throat> all right. So game plan is we're going to kind of walk, walk through these cases. Uh, and then we'll pull in our imaging experts to solve all the problems as and when we need them. <clears throat> so these, these patients, uh, they're the ultimate challenge and it ain't over till it's over in many respects. You never quite know these patients have to be followed for life. You never quite know if they've got recurrent infection. And to be honest with you, your primary focus up front is being able to explant the endograft and not have them bleed to death on the table and get some sort of flow down to the legs, whether that be in line or whether it be extra anatomical. Um, and it's, uh, these cases probably take six, seven, eight hours in order to be able to do this from start to finish. And as Dr. Rahimi said, you need a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C. Now, one of the things we didn't measure is using femoral vein. Yes, yeah, so if the patient is uh, stable, coming with uh, an an uh, EVAR graft uh, using the femoral vein is certainly appropriate for that patient. But the patient needs to be young, and I usually perform those procedure in the two day uh, two days uh, as a uh, first day harvesting the vein, keeping the vein uh, in the refrigerator, and then coming back the next day and, and reconstructing the aorta. It's a long operation trying to do both at the same time. So again, need to be a stable patient. And I think one of the things when you're using femoral vein is reconstruct it in a way that you can put a stent graft in down the line. Because uh, no guarantee that they're not going to degenerate long term. And so you want to make sure you've got a long enough 
quote aortic body um, that you can actually get an endograft in there. All right. But that's a very yeah. good point. If you look at my videos from the early videos that I made until yeah. the videos I make now, the refamp and soak dacrons that I use, they get the main body gets yeah, longer, longer and longer and longer. Yeah. And longer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So this is an interesting case. I don't know if you get the audio there, but I can, I can kind of uh, tell you what is going on. I've done this with one of my uh, uh, fellows here, Dr. Rojo, uh, and this is the Evar explantation, and this is uh, uh, also in YouTube available if, if you need to. I've got it, if need be, because I've got, I've got the audio built into this. Okay. You want me to play it off here? That's all right. I, I can show it through this and, and talk through it. Okay. This is basically how I'm getting that barrel technique to get the syringe lady. It's a 20 milliliter syringe, uh, cutting the uh, end of the syringe to get the syringe lady. It needs to be long enough. Then a standard exploratory laparotomy on this patient. I start using um, uh, Ioban. This patient doesn't have one, but uh, Ioban I think is important to use. Now I've changed my practice to use that nowadays. This patient had a previous history. The omentum is stuck. It's important to preserve the omentum because you later on need to uh, either wrap your graft or you need to uh, wrap your aortic stump. So I'm preserving the momentum flap as much as possible, uh, but uh, uh, safely trying to detach it from the abdominal wall and surrounding tissue. Eventually, uh, here I get to the point that I think I have enough momentum that I just go ahead and, and just uh, cut it out from the uh, abdominal wall so I can uh, uh, perform the surgery. Now, I can I interrupt for one yeah, minute? Absolutely. Because once again, I forgot to mention that you, we're actually going to take questions from the audience. Uh, and so, if there are questions that come up during Dr. Rahimi's presentation, I think you've got the banners which they're running across the bottom of the video at the moment. Uh, you can either connect to us via the web or join us by text. We've got a big giant screen in here that shows the questions, and it's your opportunity to pimp the experts up here. So don't hold back. <laughs> So here um, I'm getting superciliac control. Usually it's necessary uh, to have this control. It'll, it'll take you about 15-20 uh, uh, minutes depending on how big the patient is, but it could be a lifesaver when you don't have a, a healthy aorta to sew to and uh, if you need more exposure. So it certainly will be helpful. Uh, let me just uh, make the video go forward. <coughs> So I usually put an umbilical uh, tape around the aorta to just to get it exposed so I can lift it up and clamp it if necessary uh, at the time of bleeding. Um, uh, there was one patient that I'm uh, probably going to show later on that actually I stapled this to the skin, came back the next day when I explanted. At least I had that at the, you know, if, if necessary. Sometimes I... Uh, well, you must have filled out... How many forms did you have to fill out <laughs> for doing that? Leaving the umbilical tape? Oh, my God. <laughs> Thank you, no one saw me. Yeah. Uh, here, I'm, I'm exposing the omentum in the beginning. Sometimes I do that if I'm questioning the viability of the omentum. I have it available. I can take a look at the end of the case if the omentum is viable. Worst thing to put a dead tissue on top of your graft. So sometimes I, I, uh, I mobilize the omentum and get it ready for, for the next step. That's an momentum and a half you got there. <laughs> <laughs> then the standard exposure of the aorta, uh, getting distal now, getting the external iliac. On this one, I uh, did an aorto external iliac bypass on the patient. So I have proximal control. Now I'm getting my distal control. I'm going to fast forward it uh, to the aortic part. <clears throat> All right, this is uh, showing the aortic aneurysm, the clamps are in the uh, renal vein. Uh, when I need to get a super renal control, I go ahead and, and just suture ligate it. And uh, as long as you preserve the adrenal, the gonadal, uh, and uh, some of the lumbar branches, you, you'll be fine uh, just uh, suture ligating the left renal vein. And you need to know the anatomy before going in with a CT scan. It's, it could be a circumferential, uh, different abnormality variant of the left renal vein. It's important to know it. Uh, it's the worst thing that you clamp this and the clamp just uh, jab through the uh, posterior uh, left renal vein. So here I suture ligated, I have the control of the uh, renal artery bilaterally and I'm getting ready to clamp. I'm heparinized and, and go ahead and clamp at this so point. So let me point one thing, I mean, again you've got circumferential control and for renal there. Um, not everybody would do that, I mean in this situation it's very comforting to have uh, circumferential control because you're worried about tearing the aortic neck and it's really nice to be able to pull up on that tape and get a clamp up above it. Absolutely. So uh, generally if 
if it's doable, if you can kind of come around behind it, I think it's very reassuring as opposed to just an anteroposterior clamp. For sure, for sure. This was again infected uh, by CT diagnosis and uh, PET CT to confirmation. Uh, getting the cultures, uh, open up the sac carefully. Uh, you have to know if the patient has type 1 or type 3 endoleak because if, if you have, you're going to get a lot of bleeding just going through that. So uh, you're not clamped here? <laughs> I am clamped. I'm yeah. clamped suprarenal. Okay. Uh, this is a gore graft so it doesn't mm -hmm. have a suprarenal uh, fixation and I'm clamped also on the iliac system. Again using the barrel technique, again I'm not with my right hand I'm not pulling out. I'm just uh, slowly advancing this in until it gives away and it's just a feeling that you get. It, it's not visualization and I don't cut the aortic neck until the place where I'm going to suture I leave aortic neck to play later on because it will retract mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is another case uh, the head is on the right side of the screen uh, this patient had an infected EVAR also you can see the IVC there again same technique but this patient had a super renal so I had a super celiac control going back to that same patient that I showed you originally after removing the infected tissue, this is a refamp and soric dacron, finishing the proximal anastomosis, and uh, lifting the graft up, getting ready to remove any other tissue that is uh, looking infected that I missed, and then I do. So how aggressive are you with that? I mean, I, I was laughing, people say, aggressive debridement of the retroperineum. It gets yeah, a lot of sometimes, bleeding. I sometimes wonder if these people have actually done one of these cases because everything's raw and bleeding and oh my lord. Yeah. As aggressive you need to be. You don't want to yeah. leave the tissue that are questionable and then uh, you'll do the uh, refamp and so uh, 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 lavage there. <clears throat> but to answer your question, as much as it needs to yeah. be, you don't need to be perfectionist because sometimes uh, uh, medially can be attached to the IVC and getting to the IVC, uh, it's controllable, manageable, but could okay. be he some headache there. <clears throat> Shall we get the other guys involved here and go Absolutely. to the CAT scans? Sure. How about it, Ponrash? Can you show us some CAT scan magic? Obviously, there's multiple ways you can make this diagnosis. There's no question that CT scans is the most common way that this diagnosis actually is made. Um, but show us, show us what you got for us. Okay. Maybe I'll start with this first case. Um, and thanks, Dr. Lumpshun, for the opportunity. I'm glad to be here sharing this podium. And I'm sure you are. Five o'clock <laughs> at night, I'm sure you've got nothing better to be doing with your time. Well, uh, so <laughs> I would like to preface here to kind of like see how I, uh, what I do. And uh, as, as we have introduced, Dr. Almala is our like the guru of uh, pet imaging and he's the director of the department. And where I see a potential value in these kind of complex patients is Yes, the diagnostic imaging is giving us the uh, answering answer to whether this patient has infection or not. So where I think there is a huge gap in this field is how do we connect this di information from diagnosis to operative care? Yeah. And there is a huge value here in terms of relating the information that is buried in the CT scans, PET scans, MRI scans, and even angiograms, and put it all into one uh, like single coordinate space, so for lack of better uh, terminology here, and, and that coordinate space is our patient who is on the table, and enable that surgeon to answer all these questions. So some of these things, as you were describing the technique, I was kind of trying to think, like, okay, how can we help with this step? So the key here is to understand what is the end result, which is treating our patient, and what are the steps involved, and how imaging can solve or address some of these steps. So there are certain steps where we can't address, but we have to know it. So maybe I can start with this first case. What you're seeing here is a CT angiogram of a patient with contrast. And what you're looking at is a 3D volume rendered image of the stent graft with all the visceral vessels, celiac, SMA, and the renals. And I will show for the people who are not familiar with 3D imaging, we can, this is our source data. All this fancy 3D rendering is coming from this scan. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, I would ask Dr. Uh, Rahimi to give a little bit of background to this patient. Why do you send this patient to CT or like, just a little uh, clinical background before I go through the CT and the PET scans for these cases? Yeah, so this is a 78-year-old male coming in with abdominal pain with a vague symptom, chills, mm -hmm. night sweat, weight loss, and had a history of EWAR. And so, 
Uh, the ER calls a scan, we evaluate this patient for uh, uh, the abdominal pain, history of EVOR. So the first thing we want to know if the patient has a symptomatic aneurysm with an uh, 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 increase in size given that if they has a type uh, 1 or 2 or different endoleaks. Mm -hmm. uh, that ruled out uh, and the CT scan was not very clear as if the patient has an infected uh, uh, EVOR. Lab comes back and the patient has a leukocytosis, so the infection, uh, uh, the differential diagnosis is, is higher now. Okay. So for that reason, we get to the, with the imaging uh, folks and ask them, uh, you know, do you see anything that I cannot see when my monitoring and review the scans with you sometimes mm -hmm. to uh, look at chrono, axial, and different uh, uh, view of this uh, EVOR and, and understanding the anatomy of it and understanding if there is any gas involved, any fluid involved, mm -hmm. and comparing it to the non-con, comparing it to previous uh, scans. Yeah, let me call, I, th I think that's fundamental. Yeah. It, it, is that when, look when it's grossly infected, anybody can make the diagnosis. It's trying to pick it up at an earlier stage, and which having the pre a prior scan to compare it with mm -hmm. is f is absolutely fundamental. That, that's what really can clue you into what's going on. When you start seeing that haziness, which gets a little bit worse, and an aneurysm that's getting bigger over a matter of months, not mm -hmm. a matter of years. That, that those are infected until proven otherwise. So uh, and uh, so these are some of the good clinical questions but like uh, as you were saying like CT uh, can help us to a certain extent but uh, in this particular context of infection it is a physiological mm -hmm. uh, uh, phenomenon where we in CT if you really look at it in uh, black and white terms it's just an attenuation map of x-rays it is not mm -hmm. going to give us if this aorta is infected sure. or infected or not but however what we can tell is if there are any indirect signs of uh, break in the aneurysm barrier, for example, or aneurysm wall, or if there is so any a calcified ring uh, on the scan six months ago, and then there's a big gap, and is yeah, that what you're going to show us? I actually have one uh, other case. Uh, so this is a different case, but here is a clear example yeah. of uh, this is how the original aneurysm wall was, and you see this little pocket that was developed, and so it, like these are indirect signs, or if you see any air in the pocket, then we know these are like indirect way of mm. knowing this is an infected graft. But Short of a recent intervention, because we sometimes see that when we do yeah. translumbar embolize, we get air in the sac. Short of that, that's a very bad sign. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, of course we have the history of interventions. If there is no history of intervention, if there is air in there, then that is suspicious. So going back to the case that we were looking at, so I'm going through the axial CT images from cranial to the caudal direction and looking for this indirect signs of inf in infection and then we go to the real uh, imaging modality which is more physiological which is PET. So I'll start with the CT and uh, go into PET images and Dr. Almala please feel free to uh, uh, pitch in uh, when, when we are reviewing the PET as well. So this is me scrolling down in the axial views at the level of supraortic uh, trunk and we go down I'm looking here at the descending thoracic aorta to the top of the stent graft and it's a little ectatic right about the level of the visceral vessels. There's our celiac takeoff, SMA, and the right renal, the left renal. And here we see a little bit of, this is the calcium in there, and we see a little bit of contrast mm -hmm. or high, uh, uh, opacification in the sac. And like even if you see here, there is a little bit of contrast and say this could be possible type 2. You can see even the lumbar arteries coming in. So these are little things we can pick up, but we cannot, at least based on this scan, tell if this is an infected aorta or not. Right. And, and these are kind of the borderline cases yep. where you are relying on yep. imaging to give you that like magical answer, right? And the same way we, we take, okay, we did the CTA then what's next? We do our physiological yeah. imaging modality, so we do PET. So obviously we can do SPECT, but PET has much more better uh, resolution and also better quantification of the metabolic activity uh, in the tissues. So, and this is, I'm just uh, showing you uh, as a reference. So what you're seeing on the top left is a CT data set without any contrast. Again, now we are focusing only on the abdominal portion where the stent graft is. And what you're seeing on the right 
is the overlay of the metabolic information or the FDG uh, pet information overlaid on top of the CT. So this way you can correlate what you see in the as a high intensity signal, for example, here in relationship to the graft. So for example, if you look at this is the attenuation corrected axial image of the pet. And here you see the uh, high signal uh, mm -hmm. right at the level of the anterior portion of the sac. So the next question is, does high signal mean really infection, right? And we don't know the full answer to that yet. We are in the process of studying it because the quantification of the PET is done just like we do CT mm -hmm. with Hansfield sure, unit. Yeah. Uh, PET is quantified by what we call SUV, standardized uptake value. And, and that is uh, really based on the individual tracer and its half-life. But this is kind of like the standard. Uh, of, so we can go with our like intensity measuring uh, tool for example for lack of better word pixel lens and here the maximum we get is around 3.9 or 4 or we can draw a region of interest right on top of that uh, segment and uh, and get an idea of what is the maximum uh, uh, and the mean uh, SUV value so here you can you're seeing 3.67 SUV that corresponds to this anterior uh, portion of the stem um, graft. You know, this is very fascinating, very interesting. I mm -hmm. was talking to my wife, she's a, a neuro-oncologist, and mm -hmm. she was like, well, we use PET-CT. I was like, wh where do you use it? She said, well, neurosurgeons always want to know, is this is inflammation or recurrence cancer? So they do something called delay PET-CT. Mm -hmm. And my wheels start turning. Uh, mm -hmm. so why don't I use this to differentiate inflammation versus infection because one of the exclusion from one of the studies we've done with the PET CT to identify graph infection was if the patient had the intervention in the last three months. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, a patient gets infection and prior to that three months, PET CT will not be helpful or is it? And that's the answer that hopefully we will have for you in a few years because we are studying this with a delay PET CT, delay uptake. Will you, will you be able to say this is inflammation or this is infection? Yes, so we can look at the yep. trend in the SUV values as well. Always listen to your wife. That's the most single <laughs> most important thing that comes out of that. Okay, Always. so we got Dr. Amala. Yes. Um, he's our right. pet uh, expert. Uh, pretty impressed. Now you are like <laughs> switching from nuclear to, from CT to nuclear. So <laughs> Don't even think about nuclear it. Nuclear skills <laughs> are excellent. Thank you, Dr. Amala. Uh, so he made my job much easier, and uh, thanks, Alan and Maham, for asking me to be with you this afternoon. I know uh, uh, this is not a topic that an imager usually come to, but I think with Pat, I'll hopefully show you where we are adding value here. And uh, as you said, sometimes it is not as easy to look for these cases with CT and alone and we need to know if there is an infection or not and this is where we are looking at where is the added value of PET in this uh, clinical scenario. So I'll show you some cases from the literature but I'll also show you some cases from our lab and feel free to um, interrupt and ask uh, like uh, make comments throughout. So this is a case from the literature where the patient has a fem uh, femoropopliteal bypass and now there is a concern whether he has an infection or not and you see the graft here but just by looking at CT you may not potentially appreciate how bad this infection is. And now when you look at it on in terms of FTG uptake you see intense FTG uptake. Now note this FTG uptake is usually by white blood cells, macrophages, and all other bacteria and other infectious, uh, uh, other rapidly metabolizing uh, cells. And when you fuse both of them, now there is no doubt that there is significant FTG uptake in that territory and uh, that area. Now, this is kind of the older generation PET scans, not the one that we have here. This is kind of the quality of images we used to get from prior non-digital PET CTs. And here you see another patient with graft, with the left femoral popliteal graft, which is now 18 month. But you can tell not only whether an infection is there or not. I mean, a common question that comes to us from Dr. Rahimi and Dr. Lamsa, like how long is the infection? Do I need to take it out completely? 
partly and on CT you get a hint of it, but now you can measure the length of it very well and get an idea about how long is the infection, where is the worst of it here. So this is a case from our lab. This is a left arm arterial venous graft, and this is probably more common that we see where infections are because these dialysis patients have a lot of infections sometimes. And here on the CT, and again, this is a CT done for attenuation correction, but you can see that we don't see as much signs of infection, but when we do the uh, like overlay of FTG and PET images, now you see significant FTG uptake here. And when we quantify it, as Paranaj was saying, and the standard uptake value, this is 14. This is like really on the much higher zone. And I'll show you some data later on, like what's considered normal and how we can redefine the field with the advances in technology. So even though you don't appreciate much on the CT, now you can see that there's significant inflammation. And this is the same image overlaid in the same rotation. So you can see from the bone and everything, it's exactly the same thing. If I show you the CT, you may not have guessed that there is even an infection in this patient. Well, now, this is another question. patient here. It's a little bit different because you can appreciate that there is there are some CT signs suggestive of infection. I mean, there is some stranding there. But when you look at the PET CT, now you have, and this is like compared to the prior images with, in terms of image quality. So this is from the literature before. You can see the image quality, how grainy it is. And you can see your edge, but there is also some noise in the background. Your signal to noise is not the best. But when you move forward now with the newer technology that we have with the digital PET CT, even though we're injecting much less radio tracer, now you can see that there is significant delineation. I mean, we can tell that there is significant FTG uptake. We can even see significant delineation of where it, the infection starts, where it ends. And this patient actually has a graft which is kind of U-shaped, so we can even see that. And you can even have a good appreciation of where that infection is and how long, if you want to like resect that area of infection, how much you need to do and how much can be left there. Uh, this well, is... Well, I can I interrupt for a minute? Because well, one, sure. one of the questions that we've got is how does PET compare to tagged white cell scan for diagnosis? So PET has higher accuracy. It's not been stud studied specifically for this one for tagged white, compared to head to head for tagged white blood cell, but it has been studied in cardiac infections comparison head to head, and this one has higher accuracy in the heart. Now in these, they probably studied in different populations. I'll show you the accuracy data, which is extremely impressive later on. This is one of your patients, Dr. Lumsden, and if you remember, this patient had an extensive graft infection, and you can see here as I'm moving up, you can see all this FTG uptake that is all the graft around it is like significant FTG uptake and inflammation here. There is nothing on the other side, and you can see, we can see the extent of the uh, FTG, inf I mean the infection that we see here, so going from the uh, popliteal area going all the way up to the femoral area, you can see the other side there is no infection there and this graft is completely uh, infected all the way through. And you can here see some other cross sections of this area with significant FTG uptake and this patient has very high SUVs of 10 and higher. Now, this is not a very kind of like easy to just plug in numbers and come up with diagnosis whether there is infection or not. This is a 73-year-old lady who has an infraregal abdominal aortic aneurysm and she ended up with an endograft already. And now that there is a concern that this endograft might have an endoleak, so a few days later, a few days before, they did a, um, a cath through the graft to measure the endograft, to mm. assess whether there's an endoleak. 
now there is a concern whether this patient is having an infection or not. So she came into the PET lab. This is a CT done before. So I have the ability of taking an old CT done and using uh, some of the imaging tools, we can uh, assess whether there is an infection or not. So when you look at the uh, graft here, uh, we can do some like MPRs and you can look here, curved MPRs, and you can see that there is an area which has a focal uptake in that area. Now, when we looked at it, I mean, the SUV max was five. For our lab numbers, these are not like an extremely high number because we're using a digital PET CT where the SUV max are higher than like if you if others have in their institutions non-digital PET CTs. So the SUVs are like a five would be more in the gray zone. And now when we look at it again, now we have the same as what Ponraj was showing us. These are the CT, these are the fused images or overlaid images, and you have this area. And this patient, we did not call it infection because it's extremely focal. And this is the site, this is the patient who had a cath and through the endograft. And you can tell that this is more of an inflammatory lesion. It's very focal, small area. And which brings into to us the issue whether like, when do you differentiate inflammation from infection? And this is one nice study that potentially looked at it and kind of come up with a, a uh, subjective or semi-quantitative tool to look at them and just like do qualitative assessment of these. So if you look at it and you have the same as the background, they call it grade one. If there is mild increase, but it's like more diffuse and not significantly higher than the others, it's now grade two. And here, if it is mild increase, but there is like one foci like what we saw before, and this is grade three. And now on, if you move on now, it can be like extremely focal. And this is grade four. And now focal with an abscess, and this is grade five. They have about 30 plus patients in this study. And what they found when they called it the grade four and five, they were like almost always right. When they called it the grade one and two, they were almost right that there is no infection. On these grade threes are probably the more problematic ones because they were right 50% of the time. It's like almost flipping a coin because some of these could be a partially treated infection, an early infection, all of these could potentially uh, result in some focal uptake that we see and may limit our ability. So these ones, I would say it's more in the gray zone. So if we get a patient like this and then we need to go ahead and potentially repeat the imaging or treat the patient and follow them clinically, because we're not like completely rolling it out. This could be and turn out to move on to become a clear florid infection, or this may be just a simple inflammation that will go away later on. So how accurate it is, and this is where I can show you most of the studies are more of a small number. This is like some of the larger number studies I'm showing you here. This is one study that used a 39 year old 39 uh, patients and they're looking for vascular graft infection. So these are not only aortic, but most of them are like arm AV grafts or dialysis grafts or lower extremities. And what you see here is that the sensitivity was 93%, specificity 91, very high positive predictive value and very high negative predictive value. Obviously it's like affected by the small sample size and the high prevalence rate. Now, another study looking at 34 patients and out of these 27 were positive and they had the sensitivity obviously of because of the high positivity rate of 100% and negative predictive value of 100%, but these were like only two patients or so, sorry, six patients. So the positive predictive value was 96% with only one patient that was like false positive there. And now coming on, where do we draw our line with SUVs? And this is like a common question that people ask us. 
And in that study, they measured the SUVs in every patient, and then they tried to do an ROC curve to get where you get the best sensitivity and specificity. And what they found is that if you use an SUV of 3.8 in this study, then they have 100% sensitivity, 86% specificity. However, I have to warn you that they use an older technology than what we have right now. And I looked in the paper, we don't know how much FTG they injected. So technically, we really, this is like more lab protocol dependent, depends on the preparation of the patient. And that's why we need to go and now in the era of digital PET scan, which where we have much better image quality, less noise, more signal, that we should be able to redefine where is this come up. I can tell you in our lab, it's not going to be 3.8. It's probably going to be higher, closer to the 7 or so, where we are pretty confident that this is an infection or so. There have been a meta-analysis looking at this, and you can see here in this meta-analysis, they included nearly nine studies. And uh, the SUV max that used in different studies have been kind of like all over the place, from 8 to 5.5 to 3.8, 3.5. But overall, the accuracy, again, it depends on how you define a positive study. If you take the most, the easiest way, which is a focal uptake, which is they had a sensitivity of 93%, specificity of 78. Mm -hmm. If you take SUVs, then it depends on what's your SUV cutoff, but they had much higher numbers. So this is an area which we are studying right now, trying to see if, if we can use this new tool not only to make a diagnosis, but also determine the length of the infection and hopefully guide the surgeon to take it back and tell them like the length of the infection is six centimeter or seven centimeter. And this is what we think you need to get your margins and this is how much you need to get out from these infections. Obviously for a graft, it's gonna be different than an endograft or EVAR or TVAR. So this is gonna make a whole lot difference in the location and the clinical scenario. But nonetheless, I think we have a new tool that will have with the high accuracy, help us determine if there is an infection or not in these patients and help guide management in these patients. Well, th thank you very much. Um, I think you've kind of made your case and this is something that most vascular surgeons don't know a lot about. They know a lot more about it now than they did before starting to listen to the show. There's a couple of questions actually, um, largely directed towards Dr. Rahimi. Can you explain supraceliac? You mentioned supraceliac control. You said it sometimes can be life-saving. It's a real pain to do it. Do I need to do it? Mm. Yes, you do need to do it. So the endograft that you're dealing with uh, could have a different fixation point, suprarenal, infrarenal. As I said, some people treat the type 1 endoleak with palmas, and that stain can go all the way to the SMA. So if you go into this surgery not planned uh, and thinking about uh, juxtarenal or suprarenal clamping, a uh, patient could be in trouble if, if, if plan changes and you have to go uh, suprarenal. It's not the end of the world. You can still get the suprarenal, uh, supraciliac control after you realize that plan A is not working, but it's nice to have it and to start with. Yeah, if you tear the order when you're taking out the suprarenals, I mean, you'll be very glad that you've got that. Uh, second thing, so you, you, what do you wash out the abdomen with? You got this big inflammatory mess back there. Do you so, use any antibiotic irrigation? So I do. I use rifampin. Uh, I use rifampin routinely uh, to to irrigate the uh, the area with. So it's again 600 milligram of uh, rifampin inside 250 milligram of uh, just a saline solution. So I do use that uh, to to irrigate the, the abdomen. Okay. All right, I want to basically come to another surgical video. Can you pull up my computer now? Um, and that is one of the techniques that uh, Maham talked about, and that is sometimes you got to be able to oversaw the aortic stump, so hopefully you can get some volume out of this. If not, I want to read it. Okay, so what you're looking at here, uh, this is a Fogarty Hydrocrypt. Again, it's what we often use when the aorta is delicate. This is the left renal artery, right renal artery, and you're looking down the barrel of the gun here. And you want to get, the, first of all, you got to make a judgment. you got to make a judgment on whether or not that uh, tissue will actually hold sutures. 
and you're going to run the suture line in one direction, bring it back in the other direction, and then you gingerly take off these clamps uh, and see whether this is going to hold. And that, of course, is in the short term. Big concern is about yoric stump blowout long term. And you make this decision based upon, you know, how bad the infection is in the bed, what, perhaps what bug that you've actually got in there, and whether there are reasonable extra anatomical uh, methodologies. I think most people have gone to inline reconstruction uh, rather than doing something like this. Maham, you want to comment? So first of all, let me say that we perceive all of these videos are up on our YouTube channels, the Bakey CV Education YouTube channel, and we've heavily focused on open aortic surgery. And the reason for that is that Medtronic and Gore and Cook have done such a good job, you know, in developing these endografts uh, that the number of open cases being done have gone way down. You will need to have open skills. This stuff is not going away, and, and it's going to be big bad cases that you got to uh, learn how to uh, cut your teeth on, and that's not a good place to cut your teeth. So appreciate Medtronic letting us focus on something uh, that is more open than it is endo, but that's really what the vascular surgery community needs at the moment. It's definitely a crucial, uh, crucial technique to know how to do to explain these uh, endografts. Now, just uh, specifically for this one, I see uh, difficulty putting the needle inside and having challenges to because of the calcified artery. So it is. Uh, there are a few things uh, that Dr. Lumpson taught me that that you could use. You can use a, 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 a towel clamp and make your hole as you go and then put the needle in and, and try to over sew this. Uh, it's very crucial to get uh, a healthy aorta. Sometimes uh, I remember a patient with an infected Evor. I knew that I cannot over sew that uh, uh, aortic stump. So I did a hepatorenal and an aorta renal to get to the normal aorta before uh, uh, doing suture ligation of this. And th when you finish with suture ligating the aortic stump, about 10% blowout chance. So uh, it's important to cover it with either omentum uh, and, and some kind of tissue, either gyrodas fascia, uh, or I'm going to show uh, the rectus abdominis muscle if you have time uh, how to do that. Uh, and it is crucial to cover this with a healthy tissue. Yeah, so once you tie this knot, this is where having supraceliac control is very nice because you never quite know if this is going to hold, and so you're going to gingerly take that clamp off and see whether or not you've got flow in the renal arteries. I mean, the problem is that you're sewing right on top of the renals, and the concern is that in order to get half-decent aortic tissue that you're impinging upon the renal arteries when you're doing this. But this is just one technique, basically, of over sewing that aortic stump. And this is where you go. Oh, <laughs> very nice. Okay, so we're running out of time. If there are any other questions, uh, please send them all in. Um, Maham, do you want to show that rectus? Sure, page absolutely. Real quick? Mm. Absolutely. If I can One of the things that we pride ourselves in in our group is we do our own flaps. I didn't know we were doing rectus flaps, but uh, mm -hmm. that's not a bad thing. So switch that over to Dr. Rahimi now, please. So this is a patient with an infected aorta. Um, I already removed the graft and I already put a refampin soaked Dacron in. Now I'm uh, mobilizing the rectus abdominis in order to uh, cover the aortic graft uh, with a healthy tissue. This patient did not have any omentum to cover, uh, surprisingly. It was very thin and I probably just devascularized and it was just not viable tissue. But I'm going to show over here how, how we can use rectus abdominis. Let me check with the crew. Is the video up? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. you're up here. Mm -hmm. All right. So. Uh, this is basically protecting the bowel and then uh, going ahead and just uh, uh, mobilizing the rectus abdominis. Uh, it's, it's a very uh, sturdy tissue, it's a very good muscle. Uh, it's, I used that recently, I think uh, two weeks ago, for uh, coverage of the groin after operator bypass, which I'll show well, also in this video. Is there anything on the pre op CT scan you need to look at about the rectus? So, for example, uh, you're either going to base it on superior epigastric or an inferior epigastric. Yes. Sometimes inferior epigastric may be being violated. Absolutely, it's a key, and that was a key for the obturator bypass because, as you know, uh, with obturator bypass, you need to get to that obturator foramen. You, sometimes you take the uh, the inferior epigastric with punity and uh, take some of the muscle off. I couldn't do that in that case, so I had yeah. to mobilize the rectus abdominis before I can get to the obturator foramen, which I'll show later on. But it, it's crucial to to preserve the blood supply, and, and in this case. 
um, uh, uh, disconnecting it superiorly and preserving the inferior epigastric artery, which I'm uh, momentarily going to show uh, the Doppler that was, uh, that was used. Now I'm going to fast forward here just to show you the muscle. You can see it's a very meaty muscle, great muscle to use, and that's a refambent soak dacron down in the hole. And uh, basically, either you can put this right on top of the graph. So the head end is to the left, legs up to the right. I apologize. Yeah. Yes, it is. Uh, so the yeah. head is on the left side of the picture. Here I'm identifying the blood supply of this. I've decided to wrap one of the limb of the aorta bifem because there was some redundancy of it. So uh, here you can see that I'm going uh, wrapping the r right limb uh, with the uh, with this muscle and uh, using the rest of it to just lie over the aorta and it's just a great coverage it's a great muscle and uh, um, i think it's, it's a viable option and uh, to, to know how to use and my big head is on the way I, let me just move on to the next case here uh, this is the operative bypass i did um, and uh, uh, this rectus abdominis muscle was on the way. In this one, the, the head is on the bottom right upside of picture, and this is a retroperitoneal exposure to do the optery bypass. Uh, this is a patient that had a cancer in their groin, and we had to do the radical resection and multiple radiation, and probably going to come back, and the oncologist needed to come back in that groin, so I just took the vessel off and went extra anatomical. Mm -hmm. Here I'm showing that uh, rectus abdominis is folded over the groin area, this is it. It's a very meaty muscle and <laughs> great to use uh, for coverage. Um, the patient have any uh, deficits afterwards? No. No, uh, but the hernia is... huge. It, it looks like... Yes. Filet mignon right there. It's, it's an excellent, excellent muscle flap. Uh, yeah. But the problem is sometimes they develop hernias here. So we, it's, it's not without, without risk. Mm -hmm. But the benefit is higher. So here, Dr. Lumsden, to your point, and very important to preserve an inferior epigastric artery. I couldn't get to the operator foramen. Uh, without mobilizing the rectus abdominis, mm -hmm. without, uh, uh, without mobilizing, I had to sacrifice uh, inferior epigastric, and that was not an option here. So after mobilizing the inferior epigastric, now the whole ward is mine. I can mobilize the uh, bladder, and I can easily go ahead and make that hole inside the uh, right. operator foramen. And I go ahead and to yep. the end. I'm about to move into free, free baseball time after 6 o'clock. <laughs> there you go. That's the end, covering the, covering the groin with a muscle flap. I think the quote of the meeting is, the world is mine, because I've got that whole <laughs> rectus flap, basically. I've got <laughs> images of the rectus if you want to see it that you can predict from the periodic series. Sure. CD. Go ahead. You got uh, three Bs here. Three go Bs. ahead. Yeah. Okay. So, what are you going to show us? So. This so has got a live TV on the fly here. So the reason I wanted to mm -hmm. bring this up is we often think of imaging as oh, something you do for endovascular cases, but the thing we wanted to kind of see is there is a lot you could like learn or see from CT imaging for even open surgical cases. So this is an example, like as we were describing, this information is already hidden in this patient's yep. CT scan. Yeah. You see the uh, deep inferior epigastric uh, arteries and the relationship of that to the rectus uh, yeah. uh, abdominis muscle, including a previous median uh, laparotomic incision. So the, the, the point I'm trying to make is, look the information often we are looking for is there in the CT, but we often look at the CT images in standard cross-sectional views, but there are other ways of like extracting that information that might right. benefit open surgical cases as well. Very so the point. closing quote is gonna be Gordon upon Raj, there is nothing you're gonna see in an angiogram that is not present on a high quality pre-op CT scan if you time. know how to interact with it and find these different branches. So that was very exciting guys, we covered a lot of ground, a lot of things we didn't get to. So this may have to be the topic for another day. Let me again thank Medtronic for their support. Thank you all for tuning in and look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.